Hello, my name is Frank Vigitay. I'm the Deputy Director of the Next Social Contract Initiative here at the New America Foundation. Uh, we are thrilled and honored to bring this panel together uh, around what is obviously one of the most talked about and relevant uh, topics of the day um, that weaves its way into a number of the areas, including a lot of the areas the Next Social Contract Initiative has attempted to, uh, to talk about and to uh, move policy on. Um, the uh, Next Social Contract Initiative was originally started as a, uh, our attempt to uh, weave together the various domestic and social policy issues and uh, programs that the New America Foundation has together in a coherent narrative that would allow people to um, understand the challenges uh, faced in the 21st century um, and how they are different from those that were in place. Uh, when the, uh, the social contract, as we now understand it, was was uh, put together in the mid-century, uh, mid-20th century. Uh, a lot of what's happened in the last few months and a couple of years uh, on Wall Street uh, has influenced the work we do uh, in some ways uh, fiscally because um, a lot of the, the uh, issues and programs we talk about are, uh, are related to and, and require the type of funding that uh, a, a strong and growing economy can uh, provide. Uh, but also I think it gets to a lot of the issues around rights and responsibilities of government, individuals, business, civic society, and that's a, been a central theme. Um, rethinking those rights and responsibilities has been a central theme of uh, what we've been talking about with the next social contract initiative. So we felt this was an important uh, and relevant discussion to have at this time. Um, we're thrilled to have our panelists here. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to, uh, well, why don't I give a brief introduction, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll turn it over quickly to uh, Andy Kessler. Um, Andy is the former uh, director of uh, Velocity Capital Management. He's done, among many other things, uh, quite a bit of writing about his time on Wall Street in a hedge fund, a um, few different hedge funds, I believe. And, um, and some commentary and analysis on what's led up to uh, the current uh, meltdown on Wall Street, much of which will be represented in his PowerPoint. Uh, next to him is Mark Sullen. Mark uh, is a former uh, Deputy Director of the National Economic Council for President Bush. He's now the Managing Director at uh, the Lindsay Group with uh, Larry Lindsay, who's the former Director of the National Economic Council. Next to him is Doug Redeker. Doug is uh, a, an important part of our economic growth team at the New America Foundation. He's uh, had uh, many years of experience in both uh, domestic and international markets uh, prior to coming to the New America Foundation. He has quite a bit to say about um, the future, particularly on, I think, on the international side of, of uh, financial markets and what role uh, government and others can play in that. And finally, we have Phil Longman. Phil is the research director for the Next Social Contract Initiative. Um, he's also a Schwartz Senior Fellow at uh, New America. And Phil's written on a number of topics, um, a great deal on demography and its impact on policy and programs. But um, for these purposes, Phil is the co-author of a proposal that would um, refocus uh, our, our uh, banking system, or at least open up more opportunities for local and community banking. You know, his uh, op-ed on that topic is included in your packet, um, and he'll be talking about that and as, as part of our overall theme, which to wrap thing, things up is the idea that um, a big part of the cause um, of the problems that have been uh, that have been going on on Wall Street has been a, that that the financial sector writ large got away from the fundamentals of what they do best. Um, and uh, both Phil's work and, and I think the comments from all of our panelists will reflect on how a return to fundamentals in the financial markets and finance will uh, will help to restore the economy and, and continue growth. So with that, I will hand off to Andy Kessler to give his presentation and then we'll have a uh, moderated discussion after that. So thank you very much. All right. Okay, good afternoon. Thanks for coming out today. Um, I come from the, from the Bay Area, got off the plane last night, and walked outside and took a deep breath, and you could smell the reform in the air. <laughs> but before anything gets reformed, you really need to know what went wrong. I mean, Wall Street is uh, not quite dead, but certainly, uh, certainly reeling and twitching on the ground. So I thought I would go through 
a set of slides that are almost all pictures. There's not too many uh, words on these things, and I'll provide a few words to add to it to figure out, you know, who killed Bear Stearns and who killed everyone else on Wall Street that uh, that disappeared over the last two months. My background. Uh, I worked on Wall Street for a lot of years. I was at Payne Weber, which is now part of UBS, still alive. I worked at Morgan Stanley, still alive. Uh, I ended up running a, a venture fund out on the West Coast and then a hedge fund. So I've been an analyst, I've been an investment banker. I've done a lot of things, um, a lot of things I can't keep a job, which is probably true. Now I, now I write in um, both op-eds and write books. So who did kill all these guys? Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, uh, Waymo, AIG, Who's the culprit? We got a thriller here. So, the first question is, was it these guys? Him? If you can't see the slides, you gotta move, because it's uh, him, maybe. This guy, maybe. Some people think someone like this. Uh, David Einhorn at Greenlight Capital, one of the, the famous shorts on Wall Street, is responsible for killing Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers. Other people think this guy's responsible for killing Wall Street. My view, I don't think it was any of them. It was more likely these guys. Anyone know who that is? That guy, that guy, or him. And I'll go through each of them, uh, not, not individually, but uh, I'm going to wind a story that will prove perhaps that it was, it was those guys. <coughs> so the history of Wall Street goes back to you know, the history of stock exchanges. And the first kind of official, you know, uh, stocks were traded on the streets in Belgium and uh, and in uh, Amsterdam, but the real official exchange was set up by uh, Queen Elizabeth, the first one, the, the one with the Roman numeral one by her name, 1567, the first royal exchange in London, and not much changed hands there. And the reason was, is that was the stock certificate, right? You had to go, you know, talk up here about things wrapped in red tape. These are wrapped in, you know, red wax seals. And if you wanted to trade that to someone else, you had to unseal it and get new seals. And it was, it was crazy. There was, there was no volume, no liquidity. Um, similarly, the insurance market was, was done in, uh, in coffee houses, uh, the famous one being Lloyd's Coffee House, where uh, underwriters would just go up and they would write their name under someone else's to ensure, uh, uh, to ensure trips as they went on uh, overseas to get coffee or tin or some such thing. Uh, Wall Street, however, uh, came together with the Buttonwood Agreement. Back in uh, the late 1700s, the New York legislature outlawed shorting, and so uh, 23 brokers got together under the Buttonwood Tree on Wall Street in uh, what was then uh, uh, New York, or was it New York? Sorry, New York, and in effect created a cartel so that they could trade stocks amongst themselves, and, and they could short if they wanted to. But really, these guys got together to uh, trade ahead of their customers. Okay, and and so we uh, since this Buttonwood Agreement, we gave these guys a monopoly on trading listed shares. Eventually, they moved from the Buttonwood tree inside and grew. They had specialists. Uh, it was a little warmer in there, but a stock exchange was as big as your voice could carry. Right, so there wasn't much technology uh, except for Edison's lights that uh, that lit up this picture. The the job of Wall Street when you when you wipe away all the thoughts of you know, uh, trading shares and naked shorts and all that kind of stuff. The real job of Wall Street is providing growth capital to great companies, to corporate America or, or the, global, uh, the global corporations. And so one of, the, one of the great companies that grew in the, in the 50s and 60s that, that you know, went public and, and um, their shares traded and they would raise capital uh, was, was of course IBM. In 1958, uh, so 50 uh, years ago, uh, Jack Kilby at Texas Instruments invented the transistor, okay? And, and then uh, simultaneously it was invented at Intel. Intel went public in the 70s. And so not only was Wall Street providing great growth capital for these companies, but they were using that same technology for their own benefit. And that's going to be a key point to figure out who killed Wall Street. So back in the 60s, you know, there's a rule on the New York Stock Exchange that the stock market is never closed two days in a row, okay? So you notice on Thanksgiving, you know, it's, it's closed Thursday, but it's open Friday. No one's there, and not much gets traded, uh, but, but that's the case. And so in 1967, here's all the, the days that the market was closed. And the way that, that certificates were, and, and stock trades were cleared is some poor schnook sat there on his desk and flipped through a pile of certificates and pulled out IBM, moved it over to this side of the table, and, you know, pulled out Kraft and moved it over to this side of the table. And in 1968, Wall Street, you know, there was hundreds of firms that went under because they couldn't get certificates to their customers fast enough. So customers just stopped 
pain. And, and, and in effect, you know, it was, it was uh, T plus five, I think they had five days to clear the trades. And Wall Street firms went under for their own credit crisis back then, and the credit crisis was more of a paper crisis. They, 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 um, they couldn't move certificates fast enough. So you can see all the days that Wall Street was closed in, in 1968. In 2008, we still have not had a day that was closed because of the credit crisis. Thank goodness, or, or we have we have some serious problems. But more importantly, since 1968, because the way they solved this is, is Wall Street started buying all those uh, big IBM machines, and they started doing electronic clearing of certificates, and, and uh, uh, there was a, a, the DTC was put in place. And so the dance between Wall Street and technology, and Wall Street and Silicon Valley started back 40 years ago, and I think planted the seeds to what went wrong 40 years later. So the, the, the initial great recipient of this, as anyone thinks of Wall Street, is the New York Stock Exchange. Never mind that you know, the New York Stock Exchange is the most obsolete institution uh, uh, left standing. Uh, but you can see, you know, they got monitors and tons of people on the floor. It makes for great TV, right? Because they throw confetti around or whatever they do uh, during the day. They wear funny suits and things like that. Uh, and yeah, the way it works is there's a specialist who is in charge of keeping an orderly market. Not that we've seen an orderly market in the last couple of months. And all these people who are trying to trade, you know, kind of gang around them and do funny signals. And although you can see they've got little pieces of technology, um, they look like uh, iPhones uh, circa 1970 or something, big, funky, ugly things. Um, all those guys can be absolutely replaced. I'm, I'm getting ahead of the story here, but you can replace every single one of them with you know these uh, servers sitting in a dark room in Jersey City. I mean, and in fact, they all have been replaced. And if you go to the stock exchange today, there's just less and less people because the the uh, trading has gone electronic. But we keep some of those guys around. And the, the reason we keep some of those guys around is on on down days, newspapers and and television need <laughs> the view of despair. Oh, man, he's had a tough day. Look at those guys. Oh. So. You know, we keep them around. We don't pay them very much, so one by one, they leave the stock exchange. But technology obsoleted their jobs. The other thing that uh, that came about in technology in the 70s was relational databases. You could take those big IBM computers and you could kind of create link lists. Any any techies in the audience, you create link lists of things, and and you can create these monster databases. So that's how they started clearing certificates. But someone said, "Gosh, you know, we could probably do more than that. We can we can use these relational databases." Uh, to, to do more interesting things. And so the, this nascent mutual fund industry grew. Back in 1980, let's say, uh, most of the money was sitting in trust departments of banks. And, and you could see people with, you know, not quite abacuses, but, you know, a, a mechanical calculators adding numbers up, and they get the green eye shades and whatever that lamp with the green thing. And, you know, it's slow, it's neurotic. You know, you could see the cobwebs on these people. Not really much happened. So, the mutual fund industry in 1980 had all of $40 billion in it. By 2000, by taking these relational databases and slicing and dicing the markets and creating funds like Fidelity Magellan and, and T. Rowe Price and Janus, although Janus wasn't around uh, until later on, you, you, could, you could manage money, you could talk to customers first by phone and then electronically and then through the web, and, and you know the money flowed from banks to mutual funds, and, and a lot more than the stock market went up. I mean, it was, it was this huge, massive shift. Again, just because of a simple, no, not so simple, but a piece of technology that ran on these IBM machines. John Bogle uh, was a guy who said, you know, we could take this even further. Rather than, you know, Magellan, where you have to have a Peter Lynch, right, and, and, and you got to pay him all sorts of money, and maybe he's good some years and not so good other years, and, you know, these humans are, are not infallible, and so what John Bogle did is he says, you know, why don't I just take the entire market, put it into this relational database, and set it up so that you know you just own the market. That, that's all. You, you, you just uh, you own it all. The S&P 500, great. And so he invented index funds, and a lot of money started flowing into these index products, and you can index almost uh, anything. Now, my view is that what John Bogle did is invented mediocrity on Wall Street because. You know, you own all the good stocks and you own all the bad stocks too. And, and you know, since 1982 and August of 82 when the bull market started, you know, you've got this, this 10x move and, and you did well. Personally, I think because I ran a hedge fund, is I, I'm a believer that, you know, you can, you can pick individual stocks and, and outperform the market. But what, what John Bogle did is, is uh, kind of threw his hands up and says, no one can outperform, so let's index. And, and, and so everyone indexes. But 
That same technology was also used by those on the New York Stock Exchange for program trading, which said, okay, hey, uh, uh, the futures, the S&P futures are a little ahead of all the underlying shares uh, in the S&P, and so you, know, you, can, you can short the futures and buy the stocks, and, and you can arbitrage this whole thing. So this whole program trading thing came into being, and the New York Stock Exchange had to, had to um, um, buy more IBM machines to handle all the trading, but trading volume went up, no one really cared. But others took the same program trading technology and created portfolio insurance. It said, you know, you can buy the S&P, but we, we can ensure you that it won't go down. Or if it does go down, you know, you'll get your money. Now, we, we kind of know what happened with that for those that were around in 87. Uh, James Baker decided not to defend the dollar on October 16th. Well, no, it was actually uh, on the Friday before. And on Monday, bang, you know, the, the, the market went down and it was exacerbated by all that uh, program trading and portfolio insurance unwinding because everyone said, oh, I got this insurance, I'm just going to sell into the market and I'll be protected. And bam, everyone headed for the exits at the same time. So you had this massive crash in October of 87. And the, remember those stock certificates first with the, the wax and, and then the guy trading around, now it's done electronically. Well, oh, come on. <laughs> now, you know, you've got, and rather, uh, uh, 20 years after that, uh, General Motors stock on, uh, on toilet paper, which is kind of what it's uh, what it's worth these days. Now, here's the important part of the story. I was working at uh, Payne Weber at the time, and uh, uh, on that Monday, on that Black Monday in 1987, uh, I was an analyst following all the companies in Silicon Valley, but I happened to be in the office that day. And it wasn't so much the New York Stock Exchange, you know, because the 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 stock exchange stayed functioning. People were selling shares, some of it electronically, some of it uh, with those specialists. But it was NASDAQ, it was the over-the-counter of the market that completely barked. And, and the reason was, is this was the NASDAQ trader. Is he's sitting there and he's got a phone, and that was really the only way that shares were traded. You know, uh, your broker uh, might call a sales trader, the sales trader would call the NASDAQ trader and sell, sell 5,000 shares of Intel, sell 5,000 shares of Apple, and the guy who make it in the market would sell it, and the like. But on October 17th, the flood October 19, 1987, the flood of phone calls into Wall Street, into these NASDAQ traders, was so huge, and every time the guy answered the phone, he or she would lose money, because someone was trying to sell shares, the market was plummeting, so what do they do? Stop answering the phone, right? So, I, I remember the last hour, people were just sitting there, you know, kind of hiding under their desk with hard hats on, and just completely not answering the phone. In the inevitable uh, congressional, um, Hearings afterward, what went wrong, you know, who killed the market, uh, someone's PowerPoint presentation back then. Uh, they, they discovered that there was this system in place called SOS, the Small Order Execution System. I think it was initiated in 1985, where you could trade up to a thousand shares electronically. You just push a button and bang, you know, the, the market maker, whether it's the specialist at the exchange or those NASDAQ guys, would have to trade those hundred shares. And, and so someone says, well, we have the so system, you know, why wasn't it used? And the answer was, well, no one turned it on. So uh, after 1987, around 88 or 89, this thing was turned on, and it kind of got discovered by traders who, who wanted to do quick execution of shares. Uh, this guy, Jeffrey Citroen, uh, had a, uh, was a young programmer, and him and his partner figured out how to write a piece of code that would sit there and just bang, you know, SOS trades, these small order execution system trades, thousand shares at a time. And, and they were successful because, you know, uh, Intel might be trading uh, 15 big, 15 and a quarter ask, okay? That's, that's what's called a spread. That's how the trader on Wall Street makes money. If you trade it, you know, you sell it to him at, 20, at 15 and he marks it up 25 cents and sells it to someone else. And that spread, that's their value of, the trader, th th that's how Wall Street makes money, at least the <laughs> traders make money. Well, Citroen was sitting there and saying, you know, gosh, I could sell it, I could buy it at 15 and uh, 16 and sell it at uh, 15 and uh, 3 16 and I could make the difference, I could trade inside that spread and make a fortune. But the problem was, he could only do a thousand shares at a time. And there was a rule built into the small order execution system that said you could only do the same trade with the same volume once every five minutes. So when prices are right, bang, you do the trade, but you wanted to do it you know, again and again and again, and you, each individual was only allowed to do it once every five minutes. Well, what, 
him and his partner could only do 2,000 chairs every five minutes, but he could fill a room with friends, and that's what he did. He just he created this day trading operation, you know, these shows bandits, and, and he just fill a room with people, and when the price was right, boom, 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 like machine gun fire. You know, the, these trades would just get executed, and, and the, the, the guy in the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ trader would just get pelted with all these shares. And so what, what, what happened is, is liquidity disappeared. It's that Wall Street firms stopped putting up capital for customers, because every time they did, it was Citrum and friends and these Soze bandits. And remember, by the late 90s, these you know day traders were everywhere. And um, uh, these guys would, would, would pick off their shares. So, so Wall Street just backed off and says, these Soze bandits are killing me. I, I'm just not going to... Uh, I'm just not going to put up capital anymore. However, those mutual fund companies still wanted to trade, you know, and, and they didn't want to trade a thousand shares of Apple. They wanted to trade a million shares of Apple. And so uh, uh, Wall Street said, I couldn't do it because I can't get the spread. I couldn't find a good picture for spread, but I found this nice uh, small, smart balance buttery spread, okay? And as spread shrunk, first the profits from uh, trading shrunk along with it, but Customers got annoyed with Wall Street saying, hey, I'm paying you guys to move these blocks, you know, million shares at a time. You know, Peter Lynch at Fidelity, he's got 10 million shares that he wants to move at the same time. So what Wall Street traders did is they would call each other up on the phone and they'd say, listen, I got a million shares of Apple that I got to move at, uh, at uh, 15 and, a, and well, you know, I got a million shares of Apple that I got to trade. Right now it's 15 to 15 and a quarter. I'm going to buy it from Fidelity at 14.75, right? So I'm going to get this huge spread on this thing, but I can't go advertise that out there. These SOS bandits are going to pick me off before I can get the trade done. So they would call every other Nasdaq trader, all their buddies, they all know each other, and say, "Listen, back off. Just give me five minutes, and just back off, and I got to get this trade done, and then it'll return back to normal." But if I can't move that the price down to 14.75, I'm not going to get this block trade done. So they did, and someone figured out that that's what they were doing. And by 1997, Wall Street uh, ponied up almost a billion dollars fine for price fixing. Now, was it price fixing? Well, kind of, but it was in response to the technology of these uh, SOS trader picking off traders. So, so not only did they have to pay a fine, and not only could they no longer manipulate the market to get these big block trades done, but along with that fine came a piece of legislation, or, or it was probably less a piece of legislation than a, a, a Securities and Exchange Commission Rule 11 AC 1 4. Now, someone in this room certainly knows what that is. Come on. It's the Display of Customer Limit Order Rule, which basically said that now, instead of hiding what your customers are doing, you have to advertise what your customers are doing so that everyone in the world could see it. And, and based on that, it ushered in the era of electronic trading. Now, any of, anyone that has worked on Wall Street, there's some great old names on here. Uh, Montgomery, Smith, Barney, Shearson, J.P. Morgan, H&Q. The other thing that you'll notice here is that uh, uh, decimalization, right? Instead of trading at eights and a quarters, but trading for a penny, the spread on the Cisco shares right now is 1684 bid, 1685 ask. And, and the reason is, is because all the customer orders are displayed out there. And if you go and uh, <laughs> trade on you know, Schwab or Fidelity, your, your trades would end up there as well. If you say, I want to buy this many shares, now it moves pretty quickly. If, if you do it on a slower trading stock, you can actually see if you pull up the software. But more importantly, uh, Instanet and the island, which was Jeff Citroen's electronic trading thing, they put servers in dark rooms of Jersey City that just and they put this technology on customers' desks and said, forget calling up a NASDAQ trader, just trade it through us, because we'll hook buyers and sellers electronically. And, and so, again, it was, it was a piece of technology and then a, a, a rulemaking body that, in effect, completely destroyed profitability for trading on Wall Street. You cannot make money trading on Wall Street. It doesn't mean there aren't still football field-sized room of people, but you'll find that you know trading on the New York Stock Exchange is not profitable anymore, and trading NASDAQ shares is not profitable anymore. Yet, there's a lot of people in nicer suits than I'm wearing and, and uh, who, who, who need to get paid or expect to get paid. And so Wall Street had to go and do something else. But, but believe me, you cannot make money trading stocks and bonds on Wall Street. So 
that Buckwood Agreement from the from the, the 18th, late 18th century. It was fun while it lasted. Goodbye. You know the the idea. You know. Trading is now just plumbing, right? It, it, it's it's uh, yeah, you still got to hire a plumber every once in a while to come in and fix it, but for the most part, it is it is not the bread and butter business of Wall Street anymore because of because of technology. So, again, not only did Wall Street, a lot of people on Wall Street want to get paid, but there was an expectation of profitability at Wall Street firms. Uh, Goldman Sachs was sort of the last partnership to go public, and there's a there's an implicit uh, agreement when Wall Street firms went public, which was we're going to make 20% return on equity. We're going to make 20% uh, operating margin. So, so for every dollar of revenue we generate, 20% of it goes to the shareholders. Now, what most people don't realize is 50 cents of that is into this pool called compensation, which is bonuses, right? It's it's how Wall Street gets paid. So it's not a bad deal, right? It's uh, for every dollar of revenue, you know. 20 for you, 50 for us, right? It's, it's, it's not a bad deal. But if you can't make money trading, which a lot, uh, trading for customers, uh, what a lot of firms did, and, and initially led by Goldman Sachs, is well, we're sitting here with this huge capitalization and access to more money. We're just gonna turn this firm into a giant hedge fund. And, and, and in effect, that's what Goldman did, and Goldman continued to perform even though uh, profits from, from trading and everything else started disappearing. Also around uh, December of 97, this guy, uh, Bill Demchuk, at, uh, it was J.P. Morgan, he's now at PNC Financial, but it was at, uh, J.P. Morgan at the time invented this thing called Bistro, which is the uh, Broad Index Secure Trust Offering. Who knows what that even means, right? But in effect, you know, in December, he did it in December of 97 because J.P. Morgan had a little too much leverage on their books, and he figured out a way with credit default swaps, and, which is, you know, a, a derivative insurance, to lay off that debt on customers in exchange for, if you will, insurance premiums. And he got it done. He was a huge hero at J.P. Morgan because the quarter was a little better than expected and the, the stock went up, et cetera. But in effect, you know, derivatives were around, but this guy really institutionalized the whole idea of derivatives. And, and so from that bistro, which is not a particularly good name, uh, came an entire alphabet soup. And if you read the alphabet soup, it says, the stock market will peak next Tuesday. All right, well, that in mind. So anyway, Wall Street, you know, it had derivatives. They were weird guys. They were professors that they would hire to, you know, kind of create algorithms and stuff. But all of a sudden, derivatives became the profit center for Wall Street. The most famous one today is this thing called uh, collateralized debt obligations, okay? And I, what, very simply, because you could spend hours on this thing, you take a, you take a pool of, of uh, loans, these mortgage-backed, uh, these mortgage loans, and you create this mortgage-backed security. You take a pool of these loans and you build them into these tranches, and then you can label some at the top, uh, AAA. Those would be the first that are paid out, and it might have a yield of five percent. But as you moved on to to lower-rated co collateralized debt obligations, which had more of the mucky stuff in it, uh, the yield went up. And and um, I'll skip this slide, but you know. <laughs> this is this is more about derivatives, and this is this is just how how amazingly complex this thing got. Where you could you could securitize, and collateralize uh, credit cards, student loans, auto loans. You know uh, that's what Wall Street did. CDO squared, CDO cubed. Uh, you can create sieves and conduits. I mean, is 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 this became a, a, an enormously profitable business for Wall Street? Uh, one reason was is it took even more giant uh, racks of, of servers sitting in dark rooms, you know, everywhere across the country to do this. And the reason, you know, these are complex algorithms to price these things, and the reason Wall Street got so excited about this is that only Wall Street knew the value of these CDOs. It's, it's, and so they can mark them up. So remember, on NASDAQ, you can no longer mark up Apple shares to trade it. But here, you're the only one that's got the server sitting in a dark room. Your customers don't. So you can mark them up. And, and, and they did. And, and they said, hey, you know, this thing is, is worth uh, 110. And, 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 you know, maybe uh, Wall Street put it together for 85 cents. I mean, you, 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 you just can't believe how profitable uh, the, the derivatives business is if only because it was only Wall Street that knew how to value these things. Okay, then came another problem. You know, the easy money times of the late, uh, uh, the mid 2000s. You know, you could see 03, 04 as, as that we came out of the recession, but still, 05, 06, and even into 07, spreads were small. Yet we had investors not only in the U.S. but around the world. The 
the Chinese and and uh, and everywhere else were accumulating our dollars, and they wanted yield, 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 yield. Give me more yield. I don't want two percent of my. You know, you don't put hundreds of billions of dollars of work and and expect two percent. You don't want more than two percent. You go. How can I make more than that? And so it was this thirst. It was this this quest for yield. And Wall Street said. I got yield, you know, you just buy the double A's instead of the triple A's and you'll get 4% instead of 3%. And, and, and so there became, uh, as, as uh, easy money times of, of uh, Greenspan kicked in, there was just this, this search for yield. And Wall Street was happy to provide it. Why? Because they can mark it up and, and make a ton of money. Um, at the same time, the whole subprime business came into being. It says one, one place to go find yield is with your worst customers, right? And, and so there became a, a, a thirst to not only find subprime loans that you could package into these CDOs, but let's start inventing subprime loans. So, you know, we've got these legions of mortgage brokers out there that were told, just, I don't care, I don't care, just bring it in, because I got some guy in, in Shanghai that's gonna buy this CDO, just bring me more, I need more subprime loans. Um, and believe me, uh, uh, Bear Stearns, Think of them as an investment banking firm. They were the second largest originator of subprime loans in this country. So they weren't just buying them from way more countrywide. They, they had, they, they just either bought or created uh, uh, legions of people to go out. Lehman Brothers was a, was a giant, but so was Morgan Stanley and uh, almost everyone else. Uh, JP Morgan didn't chase it that much, uh, uh, either did Goldman. But subprime was only in response to that thirst for yield. And so we got Wall Street, you know, uh, basically viewed this as a, into the same business as traditional banks, right? You know, the 363 banking system, which is you borrow short term at 3%, you lend long term at 6%, and you get on the golf course by 3 o'clock, right? It's just it's quite easy. And you collect that 3% yield, and it's, you know, risk free. So, so Wall Street. You know, they became body shops. They just they just hired you know smart uh, kids out of uh, out of Wharton and Stanford and Columbia, and they said, okay, you're in the derivatives business. Package these CDOs as fast as you can because we got customers out there. We can mark them up. We can get the 20% return on equity for our shareholders, and then we get our 50% uh, cut of revenues as our as our bonus. And you know, it was a great business. I mean, uh, uh, all it took was 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 capital, and you're in this 363 best. So, here's when things turned awfully wrong. <laughs> because, and you know where this is going, right? Everybody knows that when you're a sausage maker, right? You make the sausage, you know what goes in the sausage. So, you can make it, you can display it for sale, right? You can have salespeople go out there, but for God's sake, don't eat your own sausage. <laughs> And Wall Street stupidly, and I'm telling you, stupidly started eating their own sausage. They were looking out and the, you know, these funds, these banks and these southern wealth funds and, and hedge funds were making a fortune buying the CDOs, even the marked up CDOs that Wall Street was spitting out. And so, uh, you know, I'll have whatever he's on, right? Uh, is is they, they made a decision and they said, look, you know, we can not only buy these things, but we have more access to capital than any of our customers do. And so they used the Archimedes principle, which was, give me a lever long enough and a place to stand, and I'll move the entire earth, okay? And so these guys just levered up and levered up because 363, boy, it, it, it works it works well, but it works you know, at 10 to 1 leverage, but it works even better at 30 to 1 leverage, and it covers up a lot of the sins of that trading business as it can no longer make money. And this is what happened to Wall Street, okay? <laughs> they ate so much sausage that they became a bear, I mean, whatever you want to call it. Now, I put this here for the, the, the wonkier ones in the audience. Uh, 17 CFR parts 200 and 240 amendments to the Security Act. Rule 15C3 stroke one, or is that a dash one? There's a net capital rule. In, in, uh, in 04, the Europeans started getting pissed off at, at, uh, at the lack of regulation on Wall Street, and, and uh, they had put through this uh, Basel II, and they said, you know, we want to regulate Wall Street firms, and, and the SEC said, you know, I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll, we'll provide oversight, but we're going to put this little rule in that gives uh, little loophole to Wall Street firms where if you had a billion or more 
in net tangible capital, whatever that means, then uh, you, you could uh, get an exemption to the net capital rule. So instead of having 10 to 1 leverage, you can go to 30 or 35 to 1 leverage. And if you look at the firms that failed, they did it in inverse proportion to how much leverage they built and how much sausage, their own sausage, that they ate. <laughs> Zoe Cruz at Morgan Stanley uh, was given the task, whether she volunteered or not, uh, uh, history will tell. And she said, you know, uh, Morgan Stanley was underperforming even with their derivatives business. She said, you know, just give me enough capital and I could turn this thing into a hedge fund just like Goldman Sachs. But so did Jimmy Kane, you know, Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, Citigroup, Merrill Lynch, uh, UBS, and on and on and on. These guys said, we have capital, we could eat our own sausage, why are we selling this to customers? And, and for that period there of easy credit, you know, these guys were printing, uh, they were printing money. <coughs> They took risk but failed to put prudence ahead of profit or they would still be on Wall Street. And it's as simple as that. Anything you buy has, has risk associated with it. Home prices collapsed. Uh, you know, what, what, what became an army of people trying to get subprime loans, you know, evaporated overnight as, as this whole thing turned into foreclosures. And the bubble was <coughs> popped. You know, the foreclosure sign popped the Wall Street bubble and all those nicely dressed people kind of came flooding out. Okay. Uh, one of the problems was is that when a home went into foreclosure, you never knew which one, right? These things are securitized and there's tranches and you know this thing is owned around the world. And there, you know, there might be a, a home in Modesto, California. By the way, there's whole neighborhoods in Modesto, California that uh, that went under. But those loans are scattered all across a whole bunch of uh, of these CDOs for diversification. And it was like mad cow disease, right? You know, there's there was a few bad loans, but you didn't know where they were, and so you just slaughtered the, the whole bunch. And so this is the this is the uh, the metric that you, that I've been tracking for a long time, which is the ABX, which is the the prices on CDOs. These happen to be the triple A collateralized debt <laughs> obligations from home loans done in the second half of 2006, before anyone really knew that uh, you know this is in the, in the the heat of the, the bat. So these are the best. The triple A CDOs. And you can see, you know, October of 07. So a year ago, these things were selling at 96 cents on the dollar. And as the foreclosure started, it started trading down. But that last leg down from February to to uh, to March uh, 13th, I think it was, uh, which is the day that, that Bear Stearns blew up, you know, someone was playing around with these numbers. Because the trick was you would short Bear Stearns stock and then you'd go and you'd you just start selling as many of these uh, CDOs to bring the, the value down, and mark-to-market accounting um, would suggest that Bear Stearns had to write off, you know, huge piles of these loans, and no one would lend to them anymore. And and so, you know, I'm not suggesting that there was manipulation on Wall Street to go kill Wall Street firms, but there was. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ten years ago, Wall Street picked off long-term capital, right? To, you know, that long-term capital got into trouble. And Goldman and others, you know, said, "Well, maybe we can help. Let's let me see what you own." So they looked at what they owned, and then they went back and they shorted all of it, right? And so, and then they came to the rescue and moved the long-term capital book to their book and made a, made a ton of money. And, and so it's funny that a hedge fund was picked off on Wall Street. Now Wall Street was picked off by hedge funds, and the guys like Ayn Rand were shorting the shares uh, and then playing around with uh, whether you did that or not is, is conjecture, but. Uh, so here's Bear Stearns. I, I, you don't have to read that slide, but you know, I mean, the, look at look at that stock over a you know uh, a 15 year period. I mean, it went from uh, uh, nothing to I can't read those things. Thirty dollars a share or, or less, ten dollars a share to 170, and it unwound just as quickly because you know Wall Street is driven by short term loans. If you don't get the short term loans to do that 363 banking, right? You need short term loans to own these things long term with enhanced yields. Once your short term uh, credit dries up your toast. And, and that's the reason that banks were left standing, is banks have people with checking accounts, depositors, right? We're stupid, you know, because you just leave money in a checking account that doesn't earn any interest, or even a savings account, you know, they're, I don't know, I got Wells Fargo, they pay 20 basis points. I mean, they, you know, they're just, they're making a mint off my money. But I'm, I, sticky money, where Wall Street didn't have sticky money, it was all done with short-term financing. So when it blew, it blew, and at, this is literally Bear Stearns for a Christmas party, but this is Bear Stearns uh, lobby, and it's empty. And all that's left of Bear Stearns is 
you know, bags from uh, their conferences, right? And, and you know, I can sell this on eBay for at least uh, five bucks, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, almost done here. So, what happened is, you can, you can see that's, that's the day Bear Stearns blew up on the left side of that chart. You know, it bounced back into the high 80s, but the game wasn't over. And, and you know, there were hedge funds with massive amount of capital that were shorting Wall Street firms. And, you know, there were more foreclosures as the, the credit market seized up, as people couldn't withdraw money from their home equity lines, et cetera. And the thing crapped out again this summer, came back a little bit, and then uh, we took out um, we took out Lehman Brothers. We, you know, we let them fail. We, some of them fail uh, across the street here. And uh, there, and there were insurance policies with these credit default swaps uh, to, to insure against their default, and the whole thing became a mess. So a bomb went off on Wall Street in September of 1920. It was anarchists, right, who who didn't like the banking system and blew this thing up in, in front of uh, J.P. Morgan's bank. And uh, 68 years later, you know, it, it, it wasn't anarchists that uh, that blew up Wall Street. Wall Street that blew up Wall Street. Now, the good news is, I, I view Lehman Brothers like Pan Am, right? It was sort of the original innovative airline, but when they disappeared, does anyone miss Pan Am, right? Because someone else yes. took, yes, okay. <laughs> Here, you win the Bear Stearns. Uh... <laughs> so, very quickly, what happened since then is the credit markets froze up. We, you know, once, once Bear Stearns blew up, there was there was insurance policies against their default. No one knew who owned what, right? That mad cow disease was, was spreading further and further, and it was just assumed that everyone was, was going to default. I mean, this is Niagara Falls, by the way. It does freeze up every once in a while. I mean, we go do get these panics. People come out and, and, and go check out the falls. It becomes you know, a, a, an interesting topic of discussion, but it unfreezes. Um, you can see the interbank lending rate spiked and the TED spread, which is the difference between what banks have to pay for uh, credit versus uh, treasuries. You know, they just spiked to unreasonable, unreasonable, it was just frozen over levels. They've since come down because of, I think, because of actions that have been taken. Um, you know, the, the, the biggest action was Paulson's uh, $700 billion <laughs> Some people call it bailout, some people call it rescue, it's a tarp, it's a trap, you know, who, who knows what the thing is. I wrote a piece for the journal saying, you know, these guys are buying distressed securities. You know, they're, 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 not, they're not paying par for all these CDOs, and underlying these CDOs are actual homes. I mean, it may be an entire neighborhood in Modesto, but if you're buying something that's the triple A's, the ones that are still paying at 60 cents on the dollar, you can make money off of this thing. And so I wrote a piece suggesting that, you know, the Treasury could make a trillion or two trillion dollars on this. And I caught more flack than, than you would believe. But I still think it's true. Now they're starting to change this plan. Um, in, in, in trying to push the plan through, right, the Republicans said, no, you know, uh, uh, it turned it into politics and the market crapped out. And it was a great sign that, you know, people uh, in these chambers over here actually do watch what happens on Wall Street because it passed uh, the next day. Uh, or that, that next Monday. The stock market dropped on news that money can't buy happiness, so who cares? You know, that was the, the mentality, and then uh, and then they passed this thing. Uh, for any techies that this is, you know, fail is this a great internet, and then, uh, I, I thought this was the greatest sign that, uh, you know, the, the system was failing. But the, the reality of it is, is it's starting to get unfrozen. Um, uh, they changed the TARP plan to include, in, you know, direct capital injections into banks, and to guarantee you know, the interbank loans. And once that happened, those LIBOR rates and the TED spread came down. And then the other thing was Wall Street firms turned themselves into investment banks. It's okay, I landed on a taxpayer. And, and in effect, you know, once Wall Street turned themselves into bankers so they could have stupid depositors, right, who leave their money sitting around earning low interest instead of borrowing from other banks. And so the toaster jokes uh, started immediately. Um, and I, I will never look at an investment banker again ask, without asking where my free toaster is. And then uh, this is my uh, favorite slide, which is Wachovia <laughs> <laughs> and everyone else. We get a free bank! <laughs> okay, so let, now let me segue into our panel and I'll stop talking. Uh, what is going to happen to Wall Street? Well, do we go back to the old relationship banking with just wealthy individuals coming in well-dressed to go visit their banker? I doubt it, or is it the George Bailey uh, type of of banking. No, you, 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 you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. The technology, you know, if, if I wound the story right, it was it was a combination of, of technology, you know, ruining 
old line profit centers on Wall Street that were then replaced by you know the, the sausage makers eating their own sausage. But it's all based on technology. You couldn't do CDOs without giant uh, computers and Oracle databases and the like. So this, this technology is not going away. Right now we have uh, mobile versions of, of technology so people can run around and get price discovery. The New York Stock Exchange is no longer the closed system that it was. Look at the prices on that. Google 618. I think that's a rear looking, not a forward looking uh, chart. <laughs> uh, here's a, here's a, a fascinating chart which is the interlinked relationships between corporate boards, right? You know, uh, which, which uh, people complain about that they're all interlinked. But I look at that and it reminds me of that one, which is, you know, this social networking phenomenon that, that you know, you get massive of individuals who are interlinked uh, socially through technology. And I, and I think increasingly the stock market how stocks are valued, how stocks are traded, and whatever else, uh, this technology is going to permeate its way, permeate its way into uh, Wall Street. So my view is, is that the dance between technology and Wall Street. Anyone recognize that guy on the left? Uh, he's the technology. That's Mark Cuban. Uh, is 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 you know going to go on and on and on, and Wall Street is going to find new ways to not only reinvent themselves to make money again but reinvent themselves and screw themselves. Uh, 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 and the good news is, uh, at least for now, there's beautiful empty lobbies to act in ballrooms. Thank you. Appreciate it. me that could put a lot of uh, things together and sort of uh, sew things together, strands of things that we've been seeing going on over the last couple of years uh, in a way that makes it more understandable, uh, particularly the connection with Wall Street and the subprime loans that everybody has been writing about and how that came to be um, and how it is that they were able to make so much money on it and then destroy themselves with it. Um, I think we're going to be just have a discussion now with our panelists and uh, taking questions. Um, do the, any of our panelists want to have uh, some thoughts and comments on uh, Mr. Kessler's presentation? Sure. Um, thank you all for having us all here. Um, Are these on? There we go. Thank you. John Maynard Keynes once put that a pruner banker was one that goes bust at the same time that all other bankers go bust. And I think there's a lot of wisdom in that statement. One, it shows the inherent vulnerabilities of any financial institution that borrows for the short term and lends for the long term. But more importantly, it also says a lot about psychology and the hard behavior of both markets and the regulators. The reality is that both markets and the political process tends to be pro-cyclical. In the case of markets, the dynamic is about fear and greed. And in the case of the political process, it's about cheerleading and assessing blame. One of my favorite stories goes back to um, Sir Isaac Newton, who not only was the discoverer of gravity, so should be someone who realized that things can go down, um, but he was also the master of the mint at his time, um, which was the equivalent of the Treasury Secretary. And he was Treasury Secretary during one of the most famous asset bubbles, um, the South Sea Bubble. And Isaac Newton, being well above normal man, um, unlike other people, called the bubble and talked about it and said it was a bubble and said it was going to burst. And he went on and on for years and was ridiculed and finally gave in and invested at the very top and lost his entire fortune. <laughs> I think there's a lesson there, which is we, we know what human nature is, but even for the best of us, it's very hard to resist. Um, now, we're never going to be able to take human nature out of the way markets work or the way they're regulated. Um, but the policies we do set can either mitigate or exacerbate the natural doom bus cycle that exists. Um, for me, I agree with everything that, that Andy said, but I also um, whenever you have a problem this big, step back and say um, monetary policy has to play a part in this. Um, at their root, unsustainable booms um, are caused by too much money and too much credit. 
and I think when we look back on this period in 20 years, historians are going to find it um, unbelievable that there was a consensus among central banks around the world um, to look only at goods and services inflation and generally um, short shift, uh, short shrift asset prices. And the reality is we're in a boom-bust cycle um, that started in the late 90s. Um, we had a huge stock market bubble. The Federal Reserve and other policymakers ignored it. Um, it popped. Um, the conventional wisdom was then to mitigate the damage as aggressively as we can. We ended up with the Federal Reserve setting real interest rates, um, real Fed funds rate, at a negative level for 2002, 2003, and 2004. Now, negative interest rates are the equivalent of free money, so it shouldn't be surprising that we ultimately got both the credit bubble and the housing bubble out of it. The, um, now, free money also results in leverage. Um, and I agree with Andy that there is, um, you know, if there's a real boogeyman here, um, excessive leverage is, is a big one. Um, now, the government and the private sector were hand in hand in the abatement of this. Um, the GSEs were allowed to operate with minimum capital. Um, as Andy pointed out, the SEC in 2004 um, changed its net capital rule, um, which had been an effective 12 to 1 leverage cap on broker dealers. Um, and as a result, we had major financial institutions um, operating with leverage of 30 to 1, 40 to 1, 50 to 1. Now, the people who ran those institutions were even more to blame um, because they were the ones that should have known they were operating with very little margin. But I think even those leverage ratios understate how levered some of these things were. If you take a financial instrument that has 30 to 1 leverage embedded in it and put it on a balance sheet, that is levered 30 to 1. The leverage isn't 30 to 1. The leverage is 900 to 1. And some of these things, the value of these assets disappeared very rapidly just because of all the leverage that was back behind them. Now, it wasn't just financial institutions, but it was also households. Uh, the American people did its fair share of uh, borrowing too much. Now, again, government policy played a role, and I think it's instructive to look at our housing policy. Our biggest housing policy in the nation is to allow us to deduct, have a tax deduction for the interest we um, pay on our mortgage. Um, that is subsidizing borrowing. Um, the federal government has also endorsed lower down payments. Um, in the mid early 1990s, um, the Neighborhood Reinvestment Corporation started a model 3% down payment plan um, back when 20% down payments were the norm. Now, there were pretty good arguments back then that a lot of people weren't getting access to housing that should have. And the end result, though, is 15 years later, um, we succeeded more than we ever anticipated. And by 2006, um, the median down payment for first-time homeowners was only 2%. And so we had set off a process that, uh, that, that resulted in enormous leverage um, in the households themselves. Um, I'll offer up four quick solutions and a caveat. Um, first, um, central bankers have to broaden their focus to actively incorporate asset prices more into their decision making. Um, second, I think regulators need to, uh, to, to keep and expand very simple leverage ratios that exist over part of our banking system. Um, these simple leverage ratios tend to be harder to gain. Um, than the more basal to risk-weighted, internally generated type things. Um, that doesn't mean there's not a room for some risk-weighted capital requirements, but I think you need a simple leverage ratio that acts as a backstop at some level. Um, Don Powell, the former head of the FDIC, has been a, a tireless champion of this. Um, third, housing policy um, should shift from supporting leverage to supporting actual equity. So it would be much better to have some sort of match down payment assistance than to have all sorts of policies that encourage borrowing. Now, we have to realize that people who borrow the entire amount are not homeowners, they're renters with risk. <coughs> Fourth, um, every administration needs a very vocal contrarian um, in the White House, and this is probably the least likely recommendation to get recom um, that's going to get happened. You need someone who can shout, you know, wait a second when things are on the upside. Um, but the political reality is those type of people tend not to last very long. Um, 
And last, and I'll end with a, a caveat, um, as we go through this new regulatory stage, it's very important to keep in mind that bad regulation is worse than no regulation. Um, it was the AAA ratings that allowed financial institutions to buy a lot of these products um, without doing any due diligence on them in the first place. Um, someone recently wrote in the Wall Street Journal that not only did the rating agencies miss the boom side and overrated these things, but now they're, they're quote, showing up on the battlefield and bayoneting the wounded. Um, I think we would have been much better off had we had no rating agencies at all. Um, that's my, that's where I would start and I will uh, turn it over to uh, In, excuse me, in the interest of getting to the q and I'm going to sort of just make a couple of observations on Andy's presentation and, and a couple of my so-called prepared remarks and then, and then Phil. Um, first, one of the things that was mentioned, but I would augment it and, and, and maybe take a different argument to it. You, you mentioned, Andy, that China had all this money and was seeking a yield, not just China, but other countries. Um, and that was a major driver. I would say if there was one single cause, although I would agree with most of the ones you identified, um, I think that this incredible amount of liquidity in the world uh, was, having been an investment banker, and, and I didn't do structured finance, so I'm going to take at least um, one side step from that. But when there were literally trillions of dollars of liquidity one day that had not been there effectively the day before, um, as a banker, when your customers, when your clients come to you and say, please, I need to put this somewhere, you can either say no, or you can give them a place to put it. And I would simply take it a different way than, than Andy put it out there, because I don't think that China and others were looking for yield. I think they were looking to go home at night. And what I mean by that is, on a daily basis, there are people who work for, I'm using China as an example because it's the largest, but there, there are others in the same position. China has reserves of around $2 trillion right now. Their import flows are around $2 billion a day, if not more. That doesn't mean that it's just a number in a system or a number on a blackboard or, or you know, just some, something that's out there in the newsprint. It means that somebody sitting on a trading desk somewhere around the world has to actually put that money to work before they can turn off the lights and go home. So the guys who sit managing China's treasury actually have a job to do, which is they get up in the morning and they get this you know, message that says, you have one and a half billion dollars to invest in the next five hours. Go to it. And what that means is they can do either the, uh, the funky stuff or, as they often do, they, they tend to do it in very low risk US treasury-like investments. So the reason that the rating agencies were so important is that they didn't actually promise a huge uptick in yield. I mean, there was a little incremental yield over treasuries on some of these triple A's. But the fact is it was perceived as being another way to put billions of dollars to bed before they could turn off the lights and go home. Now the next day they came in and there was another $2 billion waiting for them to do it. And that was not just China. It was a lot of the Gulf states because oil prices went up which was, you know, all of the stories you hear in Washington and elsewhere about the money that we're exporting, the debt that we're actually uh, incurring. Um, it, it's not just a macroeconomic phenomenon. Someone actually has to invest that money. And the impact on the market is, to some degree, what Andy was getting at. So, um, you know, I just want people to remember that. It also spills over into discussions you'll hear about uh, the U.S. dollar and the currency issues of whether it's the global reserve currency, not the subject for today, but something that again is all, excuse me, all linked to this phenomenon of the U.S. in particular exporting a lot of our currency to other countries which need to do something with it. And that liquidity created this flood of opportunity for investment bankers, for hedge funds, for traders, for everybody in the global financial system, whether it's New York or London or elsewhere, to create product. Because when your customers, as Andy said, are demanding a place to put their money, it is, it's hard for anybody <coughs> to in this room or elsewhere to argue that you would say, no, please, we don't want to sell you these products. We don't want to make the spread that Andy talked about. We want to go home and, and do the right thing. Because in a sense, I don't think these people were doing the wrong thing. I don't think that there were people out there affirmatively believing that these things were toxic and that they were trying to sell it so that it would blow up. 
but they didn't get caught up in the fact that when you came in and sat at your desk in the morning, somebody was telling you, I've got a lot of money to spend, please sell me something. And I would question whether any of us would actually say no to that basic thesis. Um, I've got a lot, of, a lot of other comments that I hope will come up in the Q&A, but I do want to just overlay a little bit of the international perspective on this, because it, it is not just U.S. dollars being traded through U.S. exchanges. We are in a situation where the markets today are 24-hour-a-day markets. They are trading in Asia before they trade in New York. And I'll leave you just with the last point, which relates to my first point, which is a lot of the spreads on U.S. Treasuries and related U.S. dollar instruments and interest rates, the tone for that is set in the morning in Asia. So that when the New York traders come in, a lot of the day's trading is actually based on what China and other Asian central banks sort of sent out into the market as what they're looking for that day. And by that, what I mean by that is, um, if you are representing a client who's looking to raise money in the capital markets, in New York or in California or otherwise, a lot of the tone of the day has already been set, in the debt markets in particular, by the time you wake up in the morning. Uh, Andy showed the image of George Bailey at the, uh, his little humble thrift, as depicted in the movie It's a Wonderful Life. And it's, it's a wonderful movie, and I'm sure we've all seen it four or five times at least. Um, and he also suggested that um, in his phrase, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. And I, I want to suggest that the image of small scale banking that you see in that movie. Um, it is highly romantic, even in 1946 when the movie came out, that was a world that was uh, being eclipsed. Um, but I want to briefly make the case that uh, small is beautiful um, going forward. Now, the first thing to notice is that uh, for a generation now, we've been hearing that um, big is beautiful in finance. You know, global finance takes capital where it's in surplus, China or Dubai, and reallocates it to places where it's short. And that's the theory of why big is better. In this case, they took lots of capital from China and Dubai and put it into places like East Cleveland and Stockton, California, and underwrote massive <coughs> amounts of sprawl in auto-dependent suburbs. This was not a smart allocation of the world's capital. So the first thing that's changed is we've let the big boys do what they do. And they've revealed themselves through all this machinery to have made really rather spectacular investments that I don't think George Bailey would have ever done. Small scale banking is different in that it has, it's rich in what Bernanke himself has called informational capital. That is, if you think of that move, that, that scene in It's a Wonderful Life, where there's the run on the bank, and George Bailey gets up on the table, and he says to his, his, his customers, who are also his neighbors and fellow parishioners, no doubt, he says, you gotta understand, the money's not here. It's not in, it's not in the vault. It, it, it's in your house, Mrs. Kennedy, and you live right next door to, to Mr. Jones, and you know that you're going to um, be all right. You can see that he's gonna pay that money back as best you can. This is the rich informational capital we have a system now where the distance between the ultimate borrower and the ultimate lender is so wide that they, they don't know each other. They don't have much of any way to find out about each other. And so that's an enormous inefficiency in the market. It's a lack of personal information. Now, small scale banking, um, you know, just as recently as a few years ago, most of the people would say it's best a a niche market, a vestigial market. And I will say that in a world in which Americans don't save anything, um, community banking doesn't work. If you want to run a thrift like George Bailey's, it's important that your customers um, save. Otherwise, you'll have no money to lend. But it also means that from George Bailey's point of view, there's a kind of mutuality of interest um, between him and his customers. Why wouldn't George Bailey sell you a subprime loan with an um, explosive device inside? 
It's because he needs you to thrive in order to get your deposits. You know, why would he give you a toaster? It's because banks in those days actually had an interest in encouraging thrift because they relied on the actual deposits of thrifty people. So they had to constantly strike this balance. Can small-scale banking make a big return? I don't think so without some change in public policy. The result already of the bailout rescue plan is just three banks, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan, and, uh, and uh, Citigroup, control 30% of all deposits in the United States and 40% of all the commercial loans. But before this is done, we're going to have tremendous concentration of, of, of economic power in the hands of just a few big money center, center banks or whatever we're going to call them nowadays. Um, we need to counter bail against that. And uh, I, I have in your packets is a uh, op-ed piece that I've written with Emily Simon, my colleague, who's uh, also a former head of the Office of, of Thrift Supervision. And, uh, and we are on uh, the 19th uh, unveiling a white paper that has a lot more detail on this plan. But essentially our plan is, first, let's make sure that the small scale banks, banks with a uh, billion dollars or less in assets, and that have a real, are playing a real uh, role in investing in their own communities, that they get a proper share of this big, this big rescue package. But more than that, going forward, I think we need to uh, create a mechanism whereby we, we create some balance between big and small. And one idea for doing that um, would be to put a transaction tax, I think uh, a transaction tax of half a penny per trade on uh, asset-backed securities would be enough to fund, uh, let's call it a, a community bank investment trust that would take equity positions of small-scale banks that made, met uh, strict criteria for community investment, for general health. Um, and it's a funny thing now, is if you, you can, so far this year, the, the failure rate among banks with less than a billion dollars is one-seventh that the failure rate of banks with assets of more than a billion dollars. If you look at traditional uh, metrics of bank health, turn on equity, turn on assets, number of defaults, um, you can find little uh, community banks on the south side of Los Angeles that have better numbers than J.P. Morgan. Not hard to do at all. Basically, these guys stuck to their knitting. They didn't get involved in all the financial crack. Um, they are um, deeply invested in their community. And I think um, this is a kind of old-fashioned and somewhat romantic view. But actually, in the face of these kinds of numbers and these kinds of results, it's a very hard-headed thing to say. <laughs> well, we've had a very wide-ranging discussion and uh, many, many possible solutions discussed, and so I'm sure everyone has some thoughts and questions. Uh, did anyone want to start out? Uh, I have a couple of questions. First, is this uh, money got to go somewhere? So in this process, who really got the money? And also we are talking about this uh, easy money, free money, and those are from foreign country. Are those are uh, foreign country able to get money back? And also, does the current bailout uh, plan need to be modified? If to be modified, it's necessary. Uh, it's the new administration uh, uh, is able to, to do. And uh, last and uh, fourth question: Should the dollar-based economy change back to gold-based economy? Thank you. Hmm. Hmm. Anyone want to take that one on? <laughs> I'll, I'll start with the last question. Um, I, I don't think going back to the gold standard would be a good idea. I mean, in the past, we had you know financial panics that were caused just by the, the movement of gold around the country, around the world. Um, and it's, it's you know there's imperfections with any type of uh, monetary policy you have. 
but you know, fiat money is more flexible and it's able to, to grow with an economy in the way it needs to be. Um, so I don't, I don't think the gold standard is, is, is what we need. Um, on the on the, the government's uh, the, the government's program, um, you asked should it be changed. Um, part of that question requires us knowing what exactly it is. Um, the, the authority they have is, is so broad, um, and they've committed um, you know roughly 250 billion to one sort of of the 700 billion to one avenue and um, we don't really know how they're going to do, do the rest. Um, the, the, the advantage of doing the, the bank equity um, injections that they're doing is, is it's, when you put capital into a bank, um, it gets, it's, there's leverage applied to it. And so think of it as if a bank had a, a prudent 10 to 1 leverage ratio, when you put $250 billion of bank capital out there, um, that's supporting two and a half trillion dollars of lending. And I think their expectations are a little bit high where people think that banks are actually going to be doing more lending um, when the reality is the entire economy is deleveraging right now and what this program is actually doing is, is limiting the amount of deleveraging that we would have had otherwise. Um, but I think that the, 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 the you want to start with you know, protecting um, the deposit base um, sort of the heart of the financial institution, and that should be uh, uh, the financial system, and that should be priority number one. And, uh, I think you also asked where, where the money is right now. Where's that? Just uh, so you, as of last count, and that may change because these markets move pretty quickly. Uh, central banks around the world hold approximately eight trillion dollars of reserves, and sovereign wealth funds hold somewhere between three and three and a half trillion dollars of reserves. That's important not just in its absolute numerical uh, size, but because particularly the central bank reserves, that's cash. That is where the liquidity is today. So it's not just that the US has a $14 trillion economy or that our markets are worth a multiple on that, but the cash, which is available for you know investment, for bailouts, whatever you want to call them, does in fact reside with global central banks and to some degree several of them. <coughs> Each presentation was fascinating and helpful in weaving together the threads of this fabric that um, <coughs> has been unraveling on us. There are two threads out there that I'm trying to figure out how they fit into the pieces that you gentlemen discussed and maybe you could uh, help me as far as where the relationship was and wasn't and to what extent and the two things I'm looking at is the uh, political pressures on Freddie and Fannie and various banks to do some prime mortgage uh, lending as social policy divorce to financial merit and the changes to the laws for the banking systems that had to happen from the mid-70s forward for these types of transactions and derivatives and leveraging and subprimes to happen and who was pushing them and which came first, the chicken or the egg in some cases. It's always the omelet that comes first, doesn't it? <laughs> um, you know, I, I guess um, when I, whenever I look at markets, and I don't care whether it's the stock market or credit markets uh, or anything else, for them to be efficient, you need to have price discovery. You need prices to be correct. Because if, if a price is wrong, then it creates inefficiencies in the markets and the economy and the like. So um, if you go back to what I was talking about in, um, in, the, in the late 90s and the fact that um, NASDAQ traders just backed off and wouldn't put up uh, firms' capital to trade NASDAQ shares, that happened to be one of the reasons that we got a stock market bubble and dot coms. Because all it took was someone like Henry Blodgett, who was a, he's a friend of mine, but he's a, he was an analyst at a C-plus firm on Wall Street. And 
you know, he, he got up and banged the table one morning on Amazon and, and basically just breathed on these shares. And since there was no liquidity, there were more buyers than sellers, and, and NASDAQ traders, you know, wouldn't put up any input, the thing went up 20 points or 30 points. And then everyone else in the world woke up and said, ooh, this Amazon must be a good uh, stock. And gee, if it's going to go up 20, maybe it can go up 20 more. And, and, and you ended up getting this money-making uh, mania. I, if it was an efficient market, the sellers would have stepped up. But instead, money started flowing into growth funds, and, and the whole thing uh, you know, was, was like pushing things through a funnel. There weren't enough shares. Uh, outstanding and and, uh, and and the thing went up and I think it was the same thing in the credit markets where uh, as you mentioned you know the in, in China they would wake up and they go I got to put money to work what's the safest place well you know we're kind of out of 30-year government bonds because and, and that was the that was the uh, Greenspan conundrum he said you know God I'm, I'm, I'm pushing on the low end but there's no one Inflation and you know, the 30-year bond yields aren't going up but the reason was is the Chinese would come in and, and, and other side of funds and just it would sell out. There weren't any more. And so, you know, in, in both chasing yield and chasing that safety, they would start buying Fannie and Freddie uh, uh, securities. If you go to the root cause of that, and God, this is such a bigger discussion. I actually think it has more to do with the jawboning on the dollars. Is the, the mentality, certainly in this town and, and, and everywhere else, that, that we are still in an industrial economy from the George Bailey days. We're not in an industrial economy, we're in a knowledge economy. And when we're in a knowledge economy, you know, the currency rates uh, are still stuck in this whole export, you know, let's export, uh, you know, steel wrapped around tires as cars, and let's, let's export machinery and those kind of things. But actually what we export is software where there is no cost of goods, and we export microprocessors, and we export, uh, you know, iPhones and everything else. It happens to be manufactured in China and Taiwan and Singapore and Hong Kong and everywhere else, but we get the margin, we get the markup on those things. And so I think the jawboning of, oh, you know, the Chinese, they really need to, you know, let their currency appreciate, uh, you know, it was the cause of them uh, having huge piles of capital rather than investing it back in the U.S. And I think if we had been in an era of a strong dollar, you know, a lot of this wouldn't have happened because the, in the strong dollar, the value of our microprocessors and our software and everything else would have increased. Now, it would have decreased the value of autos and steel and all those things that, you know, we probably shouldn't be doing anymore anyway. We, you know, those are low margin businesses. But the politics of it, I think, kept the dollar down. The bad news or the sad news is that, you know, by the time we, hopefully this works, by the time we fix our system here, then uh, the rest of the world that we're sitting on our dollars and using them as gold, because you know, in China, our reserves, that's their gold, right? They shove that in their banks and then they go lend 10 to one or more against that. And you know, believe me, there were a lot of stupider loans taking, but you just walk through Beijing and Shanghai and note all the empty buildings with uh, cranes or not. And I think that's the, that's the next disaster to happen. And I think hopefully the US financial system is uh, is strong enough so that when that blows up, you know, it'll be a sneeze, not a, uh, not a tsunami. Of, of, uh, <laughs> Rob Fellery, Asian American Chamber. Just a quick question. The one thing I didn't see in the presentation is the uh, elaboration on conflict of interest. You have, you have banks which are uh, lenders as well as equity investors as well as in some cases mezzanine. Um, and in some cases investment banking advisors. How do you ensure a fair process? And then and that's to the, up to Andy and then and gets to Doug this question of um, being uh, ready to invest such capital. A lot of these economies were emerging market that taken some sort of time, what have you. Has <coughs> the culture been sort of like the Silicon Valley culture where they're not going to get the returns they're used to? Do these pe people still have sort of security in their jobs? Are, are they under immense pressure to sort of be reactive? Thank you. So th th there's, a, there's a saying in Silicon Valley, I don't think anyone would say this out loud on Wall Street, but there's a, Sil uh, a saying in Silicon Valley that goes something like this. Uh, no conflict, no interest, right? Meaning, uh, I, I, I better have some conflict before I invest in this thing. Either I can, you know, uh, go on the board or, or make sure that this thing works. I, I think on in, on Wall Street in the post Glass Steagall era, right, which is '99 on, that uh, there were enough compliance 
officers, you know, and compliance things built in that, uh, and you know, what's known as a Chinese wall between investment banking and banking and the trading and the like. But I, I really don't think that it was a um, it was a conflict of interest that that caused the problems. Is the the hedge funds that were inside of Bear Stearns or inside of Goldman that were, were using a lot of leverage were really done separately. And, and the asset management business, I mean, they got different phone numbers and they got different compliance stuff. Those really were separate entities inside of the giant holding company. Having said that, it you know once the returns trickle up to the top and someone on the trading desk looks and goes, gosh, you know, this hedge fund that's run separately is making good money. You can look at the publicly available. How are they doing that? Oh, you know, they're buying the same sausage that we're making. You know, we can we can own those things too. So uh, I, I don't think in the in the post mortem you're going to find conflict of interest uh, is it, 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 going to nail it, it is going to nail Wall Street. I really don't believe that. There, yeah. let, let me just pick up on, on that, and then I'll get to the question you asked directly. Uh, there was I was in London at the time. There was a, a very famous headline about something called the spank from Hank. And I don't know if people here know what that is, but if I can mention it. When Hank Paulson was still at Goldman, um, and Hank Paulson was a traditional old-fashioned uh, relationship investment banker. Um, and what happened was, under his guidance, um, Goldman started making more money through proprietary trading and hedge fund business and, and some of the other private equity style, putting their own capital to work. I'll avoid the sausage analogy. But, um, at, at some point, there was actually an M&A deal that Goldman Sachs was advising on, and they lost the deal because Goldman Sachs private equity partners in London actually outbid them and structured the deal around them. And it, it caused great headlines, at least internationally. And the client went to Hank and, and complained. And Paulson publicly uh, scolded his colleagues and said, we are a client-focused bank. That's how we make our money, et cetera, et cetera. I think it was about six months later he left the bank and became Secretary of the Treasury. Now, I am not suggesting there is a connection. I am, however, suggesting that at least at that point in time, Goldman Sachs uh, managing directors, partners, and shareholders were very happy that Goldman Sachs was doing as well as it was financially, and they weren't really all that <coughs> thrilled to find that their big money makers were being publicly criticized by the head of the firm for actually not being a nice, old-fashioned, relationship-driven, client-focused bank. So that's just an anecdote that I just like saying, hey, the spank from my ankle is kind of um, and Quickly, you're, you're coming on, on emerging markets and where they are today. I'm not sure uh, we know the answer. I do think that there are a lot of emerging market countries that, uh, particularly in Asia, held huge reserves on the assumption that this would get them through <coughs> any potential crisis. South Korea had $250 billion of reserves, more than enough by anybody's calculation. Now it's not clear it is enough. And what the lesson that those countries are learning is remains to be seen. One of them may well be, we need more reserves. So there are those who are saying, gee, even if we had $250 billion in South Korea, that wasn't enough, let's change our thinking. It may be it just reinforces that thinking and they start to accumulate even more. And that leads to a whole bunch of, of other issues we can talk about on that side. Yeah. My name is Zogni and I'm uh, Professor of International Business. Uh, I just want to uh, add something to, uh, to uh, Andy presentation, uh, which was very good, very thorough. In fact, uh, the year uh, 1999, I was conducting a thorough research in the Wall Street because I was preparing uh, something for publications and I interviewed at least 10 persons at Wall Street, some of them uh, brokers, some of them vice presidents, and so on. And I found really there is, uh, there is sort, of, sort of fraud uh, behavior. Uh, there is some, some uh, under the table criminal activities which actually later on what happened now is really not that easy. It, it, it is, it should be under really, uh, under really uh, the criminal uh, investigations. Uh, just uh, dumping everything, the consequences on taxpayers, uh, is not fair to taxpayers. I would say, I would highly, highly recommend and I will 
propose to uh, the new president that uh, he should form commission to find out really what happened under the table. Okay, this is really uh, it's not uh, academic <coughs> exercise. It's not political exercise. Some people under he, he managed to uh, destroy very fine an institution. Thank you very much. Several commentators, can you hear me? Several commentators have pointed out that the misaligned in incentives uh, from the mortgage brokers all the way up to the rating agencies and the investment banks themselves helped create this, maybe even the major uh, reason for it. I'd like you to comment on that. Any of you, if you agree with that, uh, how would you change that? And how would regulation even begin to get their hands around something like that? Well, that goes to my point on the, the virtues of small and the virtues of a depository institution. And, um, you know, there's other things you could do to make sure that everybody has some skin in the game all the way down. But at the end of the day, what we have to reach for is how do we preserve this mutuali mutuality of interest between borrower and lender, <coughs> which exists automatically in a small-scale depository institution, but which breaks down completely once you have this anonymous, transactional, globalized financial system. That's my plug for small. So, so you know, on, on uh, at, at, at Wall Street firms, um, they really only have one asset. Okay, and it's not the people that take the elevator down every day. You know, that's an old cliche. But the the assets of Wall Street firms are their reputation. At the end of the day, you know, the, whether it's the firm or the person within the firm that's calling their client, that is all they have. So the, the misaligned interests, you know, every firm has commitment committees that meet when deals are proposed, okay? And if the deal is, you know, a little smelly, it will often get bounced at the commitment committee level because someone inevitably will say, you know what, we could do this deal, but if it blows up, it's going to damage our reputation and we're not going to be able to do the next deal. Which is why the firms with the better reputations, you know, Goldman and Morgan Stanley, tend to get the cream of the crop deals. And if they don't do it, you know, there's there's sort of the the, the a feeding frenzy amongst the, the next groups and next groups um, to do the deal. It's all done on a, on a risk-adjusted basis. So I don't think that through this, it was really the, the, the deal uh, uh, making apparatus that went wrong. You know, if, if, if you have uh, uh, a derivative of CDO and you're selling it on a, you know, on a risk adjusted basis to your customers and a rating agency, which by the way, there's only three and maybe there should be 300 of them. So you can, you know, you, because there's no reputational risk for three uh, rating agencies. Uh, they screw up, they go, well, you know, we'll get the next deal. Um, but, you know, if you get a rating agency to put a high enough rating on, then a commitment committee is saying, okay, you know, we can sell this to our customers. In, in effect, and I'll answer a little bit of the previous comment, is it was, really, uh, it was really the stupidity of owning these securities themselves. That wasn't a reputational risk. That was a, a structural risk of, of having too much capital because it was easy times and you could load up your balance sheet with capital. And, and like it was mentioned with sovereign wealth funds, having to put that capital somewhere to generate premium returns for shareholders. And, and, and that's where, uh, that didn't go through a commitment committee, that went through the CEO's office to say, yes, let's, let's put our capital up. You, the last I checked, you, the criminal code does not include stupidity. You can't be arrested for stupidity, but you can get thrown out of the business uh, for, for stupidity. So why anyone would, you know, if they had survived, anyone would do business with Bear Stearns or Merrill Lynch after the debacle of, uh, of, of, of the dot-com era is if you look through time, it's, it's reputation that drives Wall Street. And I think there's a lot of rebuilding of, I mean, I feel sorry for my friends that worked at Bear Stearns or Lehman Brothers, and I have plenty of them because they're the butt of jokes. And that's why I started to think, you know, the firms I work for are kind of still around, you know, uh, uh, 
gosh, maybe I was smart. Well, no, that's not the case. It, it, it's, but it was the stupidity of upper management uh, that, that, that put not the deal-making reputational risk, but the chasing yields and, and, and chasing returns that put the whole firm at risk. <laughs> Brian Berry from Europolitics. Um, next week, you have the G20 leaders meeting to try and figure out how to move forward. Um, I'm wondering if any of you have any thoughts uh, specifically on the whole issue of regulating uh, the financial sector and some people are saying you know, can't, that eventually Wall Street will just find ways to circumvent whatever is, is, is regulated. And just wondering what, what your thoughts on that. I think that next week's G20 could be one of the more significant uh, meetings that we've seen in, in recent years, precisely for the point that you raised, which is if there is not a coordinated response that means something, uh, then there is the risk that you're going to have regulatory arbitrage. And it is a um, somewhat of a fallacy to believe that any one market, the US or London or Dubai or, or others, is an indispensable center at this point. Capital is going to flow very quickly as it does, and there are alternative places to base your trading operations if you are perceived in running a, a, a business that it's easier to make money in that market. That doesn't mean it's smarter. I want to make that stupid comment that, that Andy made. I mean, you, you, know, you can be stupid, but in the short term at least, it may be easier to make money. So my great hope is that coming out of the G20, there is some consensus on a real structure to take the top financial markets and have some way that they are, if not globally regulated, I think that's probably an overreach, but globally coordinated so that there are principles, hopefully binding principles, that all of the market participants agree to be bound by, that you would not have the opportunity for regulatory arbitrage. Because it's one of my great fears that moving ahead, you've already got the risk of hedge funds and private equity funds that are treated differently than uh, banks. Uh, where you can see some activities that, that flow into those instead of regulated <coughs> entities. Let's not present them with also a geographic option to move some of the riskier or potentially more stupid businesses, as, as Andy mentioned the word stupid again, um, you know, to some other venue. And uh, you know, we end up with the same systemic risks because we haven't had a, uh, some sort of a, a, an, over, an overall global regulatory agreement to avoid that regulatory arbitrage possibility. Okay. Um, um, no matter what regulations and laws and reforms that get passed, you know, you you, you can't. Uh, dampen the animal spirits of capital, okay? So uh, to echo the point, you know, capital uh, sloshes around the globe seeking its highest return. And uh, sometimes it does it well, and other times it, it, it ends up losing money. And, and so, uh, you know, I ran a hedge fund for a lot of years, and uh, we registered the hedge fund in the Cayman Islands. So there's a plaque on the wall of some law firm that I paid god awful amounts of money to register our hedge fund and it came out. So the only reason I did that is so my uh, non-US investors wouldn't have to pay capital gains tax. It's that simple. They, they wouldn't come in my fund, you know, unless it was an offshore. And I've never been to the Cayman Islands. I'd like to someday because I want to see my plaque, right? Uh, uh, there's not too many times in life you get a plaque put up with uh, with your name on it, your firm's name on it. But, you know, it, you know, I, I think you, no matter what reform comes into play, it, it usually has unintended consequences. But at the end of the day, you know, uh, you, you, if you outlaw risk taking, which is what seems to be in the air, then only outlaws will take risk, okay? And it'll be easier for hedge funds or other less regulated entities uh, to generate great returns. And, and uh, the banks, let alone the you know the thrifts will be sitting there uh, with the with the scraps, and 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 I, I really think that's just how it is. So hopefully, you know the regulation regulation or the reform structure that gets put in place is more about transparency, so you can look in. Because remember, people don't do st stupid things or ugly things if someone else is looking over their shoulder, and I think that's true of Wall Street. Is you know 
no one really had an idea that they were loading up on all these CDOs. And Citigroup had these sieves and these conduits, these structured investment that were off balance sheet. And it's because there weren't the transparency rules to, to go look in. And so if, if the G20 or G14 or, you know, they, they keep changing the number on, uh, on, on uh, how many Gs there are. But, uh, uh, you know, if, if it could be, you know, this whole idea of, uh, of sunshine and, and transparency, then I think we'll get back a lot quicker to the traditional role of capital markets providing growth capital to great companies and starving the bad. My name is Inouye, and I have a question for Mr. Two sentences in the uh, title of this discussion. <coughs> First question, is the Wall Street is dead or no? No. No? Second question. What's the next question? Uh, next question, of course. Do we need Wall Street as <coughs> instrument if, if, because your presentation is wonderful. It's, it's the proof that if Wall Street cannot suicide itself, we need to kill them. <laughs> <laughs> because who is victims? People victims, not vendors. And again, we don't need instrument when some stupidity crush all the things. It, it's, it's stupidity to have such instrument. Well, I would just say, <coughs> as long as the United States is running these incredible trade deficits, we're going to have these huge imbalances, um, financial imbalances around the world. And, you know, I'm not, I'm advocating for George Bailey, I'm not advocating for an end of globalism. I do think, however, there's a space for public policy to do something like create a infrastructure bank in the United States that would give your <coughs> Chinese friends who wake up in the morning and try to get rid of all this cash, some other place to put it, and that we could put it to work um, through a quasi-public process um, towards uh, you know, public investments that will make a return, a social return anyway. And that's just a whole bunch better idea than refinancing that, 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 that's a plug for a paper that we did about six months ago, so thank you me. <laughs> so, so a, a quick comment is uh, back in about 10 years ago, these two guys uh, got together and they came up with some funky uh, algorithm and they wanted to start a company and they could have gone to their local, there's a Silicon Valley bank and there's, you know, the first bank of uh, Menlo Park, California. I'm, I'm sure I've seen it. And, uh, but no banker would lend these two little knuckleheads, you know. Uh, one was from out of the country, the other, you know, he didn't dress well and had a bad haircut. And, and, uh, but instead, they raised venture capital for this search uh, technology when there was plenty of other search technology. And the only reason that they did is the venture capitalists knew that behind them were these capital markets that if this thing worked, they would be able to raise huge quantities of money. These two guys could raise huge quantities of money, but as they built a company with risk capital, they could. And if, you know, if it's the Google story, you can pick whatever story you want, whether it's the next set of solar cell companies, these are big, expensive propositions. And what Wall Street does is it funds these great companies. It funds a lot of terrible ones, too. And money's made, money's lost. There's no guarantee that the stock market is supposed to go up every year, just like there's no guarantee that housing is supposed to go up every year. And, and I think individuals, you know, if they haven't learned yet, they've learned now that, you know, the capital markets are risky and you've got to do homework. And, and you know, there, there, there is no safe, except for a bank account that doesn't pay any interest, you know, 20 basis point interest, there is nothing that's safe. And it, it's pure and simple. I happen to think it is the safest place because if you can find the next great set of companies, you're going to make 10x returns, not 10 basis points. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Great presentation. I learned a lot in, in this afternoon. I wanted to ask you about um, the stability of the retail banking sector. In Washington, D.C., it seems as though we're seeing more and more banks uh, being built on the corners where some of my favorite restaurants used to be, including right up at the corner here, where Red Sage used to be. There doesn't seem to be any um, 
evaluation of retail banking in general, at least in this area. Do you have a comment about that? Because that just seems to be a very strong aspect of the industry in general. Well, I'll just say one thing. There actually is no legal or official definition of what a community bank is. It's just kind of a term of the industry. So it embraces everything from these little boutique shops on K Street that are basically catering to high income individuals in a hands on way. That's relationship banking. And I suppose it has a niche. From what I know about it, it's they're overextended at this point. They've got too many banks, these are the restaurants are going to pack. But there's a different vision of what community banking is, um, in which the bank is is in one geographical area, it serves that it's 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 its lenders and its borrowers or savers are the same people. Uh, its board is taken from people in the community, um, and it has a vested interest in the health of that community because if that community goes down, they don't do it anywhere else. And so you find, for example, uh, Grant Thornton did this uh, survey a while ago of. of of community bankers, and it, you know, it turns out 95% of them are on their local chamber of commerce. You know, 93% of them are involved in various charitable drives within the community. There's just this mutuality of interest, not only between saver and borrower, but from the bank itself and the community. And one of the things we've seen around the country is we've had this enormous bank consolidation. Um, I was in Florida through much of the 80s and 90s, and coming into that era, every little <coughs> Down in Florida and the big cities too, they had all these different um, small banks that together funded the symphony, funded the uh, you know whatever drive was going on. And by the time I left Florida, and the, uh, you know there was just a handful of bank holding companies in Charlotte and Atlanta and New York, and Florida didn't have anything. Uh, so all those relationships between the philanthropical world and the, and the downtown community, there wasn't anybody that had a vested interest in bringing the community together and working it for common purpose. So we had this terrible loss of social capital. Um, and this is just another argument for why we want to bring banking back to human scale in the community. A couple of questions. I, uh, heard here, I guess, the notion that uh, there was maybe too much money chasing too few good ideas and such a consolidation of that uh, wealth in uh, certain hands and the need to deploy that. And to me, that seems exacerbated by maybe a few dominant players in banking and in the capital market. So you have even fewer ideas with fewer players. So you have too much money chasing too few good ideas and fewer ideas among a fewer players. That seems to be only further exacerbated by the policies coming out of Washington. Should it be an objective of regulatory reform, I think as Mr. Longman is suggesting, uh, to uh, have a regulatory system that fosters maybe more of a diversity of institutions so you get more good ideas and maybe less of the herd mentality of, of the capital markets? And I guess the second question is, can we really regulate leverage, uh, given all the financial instruments uh, out there? And um, uh, how do you best regulate you know, uh, credit derivatives? <laughs> well, I'll, on your first question, I think it's, it's when you have too much money chasing um, too few products, you have to step back and say, well, why do we have too much money in the first place? And so it does start with one, the simple things to have policy that was too easy, and two, the international system um, that, frankly, after the Asian crisis um, in 1997, more countries around the world chose to run current account surpluses. Um, we had a development strategy for China. They had a development strategy, um, ran bigger and bigger current account surpluses. And if you have half the world running those big imbalances, the other countries are going to take them. And so the U.S. borrowed more and more. And, you know, part of it is strategies by other countries, but we were, we accepted it. We didn't, we didn't fight it in any way. Um, and right now, if you look around the world, um, you look at the biggest borrowing countries, U.S., U.K., Spain, Australia, 
um, those are the ones that are going to be, be hurt the most when we have a global uh, credit contraction. And you know, about 15 years ago, Ross Perot was famous for saying, talking about that giant sucking sound to the south. Um, that giant sucking sound we hear right now is global capital going back to its home country everywhere in the world. Um, and the borrower countries are the ones that are going to be, the both sides of the ledger get hurt, but the borrowing countries are going to be the ones that, that get hurt the most. Uh, uh, Gordon Bear, State Department. Following up in part on uh, your, uh, your comments just now, uh, there's been a certain amount of schadenfreude, and not to say glee, on the part of uh, some of the Western Europeans, Russians, and so <coughs> forth at the uh, demise of uh, Wall Street. At the same time, that most of their markets are down 10 to 30 percentage points more than ours. Looking down the road, uh, you know, five years or so, how would you assess the balance of global financial power? Is Wall Street going to sort of be top dog still? <coughs> yeah, uh, I'll, I'll take an unpopular position and say I'm not sure, at least leading up to the crisis, that Wall Street was in the sole top position. Uh, in fact, recent polls of global financiers put the U.S. at second behind London and Singapore nipping at the U.S. heels for where the global financial center was. Now, you, you know, the financial crisis did a lot of things. One thing it did is it forced a lot of people into the single most liquid safe haven, the, uh, the U.S. dollar. So, in fact, when you would I would agree with you that there's a lot of schadenfreude around the world and a lot of finger pointing that we can expect both now at the G20 and thereafter. Towards the U.S., you're nevertheless seeing a much greater strengthening of the U.S. dollar than you might expect, largely because it is the single most liquid, safe um, place to put your money and everybody, instead of panic, flock to the U.S. dollar. Whether that's sustainable or not remains to be seen. I think it can go either of a number of different ways, one of which is the dollar remains the world's de facto global reserve currency. Uh, the other is that certain other countries decide that um, there is a need to start thinking about a more multipolar currency basket. Uh, that talk happens every once in a while, and then we see something like this where the dollar strengthens and that talk goes away. I would not assume the U.S. dollar's preeminence uh, is going to go on forever. At five years, I think it's a little bit short, but nevertheless, you know, I, I don't think we should take it for granted, and I don't think the U.S. Uh, supremacy or sole dominance of the global financial markets is something we should take for granted either. Yeah, so quick, quick comment. First, I don't believe that the U.S. ever gave up their dominant role. It, it, it is, you know, uh, there were interesting uh, new products and markets in, in London, especially for um, to go public. AIM was, was one, and a lot of companies in the U.S. went public there. One, because the accounting was, was a little different. But the reality of it is, is, is if you went public on these AIM markets, you weren't really public. It was like the Roche Motel, right? You, you, it was sort of a name only, but you couldn't sell any shares. You couldn't get your capital out. It wasn't a liquid enough market. But numbers-wise, you know, there were more IPOs on AIM than there were in the U.S. So the, you know, the, it was uh, Chuck Schumer and uh, Mayor <coughs> Bloomberg that wrote a piece saying, oh, you know, New York is losing it. We've got to do something to help them. The reality of it is, is that, you know, the, the, the U.S., was and I think will continue to be the most the predominant capital markets, not because of the surface things which are important, like we have the, the, the best set of rules and we are the most transparent and and, um, and like, but that wealth is created not by increasing home prices or commodity prices, but that wealth is created via productivity. I mean, it's it's. Got to dig through economics, and it's it's all about you know getting more output per worker out. It's about productivity, and what we do in the U.S. and, and it's not making steel although that was productive many years ago, or cars for transportation that was productive years ago. But now our productivity is is based on knowledge productivity. It's 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 search engines and it's databases and it's network equipment and the like. And as long as those are still businesses that are invented here in the U.S. and by the way they are because there's still a net flow of people from 
from uh, Mumbai and, and Shanghai coming to Silicon Valley than there is you know, companies being set up over there on, on the knowledge side, not on the manufacturing side or assembly side, but on the you know, creating the productive tools. As long as that is here, then I believe that we will continue to have uh, the, the dominant capital market. So yes, we're a safe haven, but I think uh, that a lot of that money is, is, is going to be sticky for, for some time to come. Um, I have a simple question. What does it take for the U.S. to lose its AAA credit rating for a sovereign bond? If, if the bail down isn't enough, uh, what does it take? What does it mean for the credibility of the credit rating at a particular moment that nothing seems to be able to remove that rating? That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> Well, you know, you, you, you did over the last six months start to see um, some movements and actually, you know, kind of derivatives tied to whether the, the treasuries will get repaid for the first time. Um, and you've seen actually instances where derivatives were uh, higher on U.S. treasuries than they were on Campbell Soup stock, for instance, uh, which is a, a little bit of, a, of an alarm bell. Um, I think that the, you know, for, you know, when I think about, um, you know, the U.S. Um, defaulting, um, I think it's, you know, it's nearly impossible. And what I worry more about is, you know, how much do we devalue our way out of it? Um, and, you know, history says a, a big um, debtor nation will choose at some point um, to devalue its currency. Um, and, you know, the Federal Reserve, for instance, has expanded balance sheet. Um, it's doubled it in the last month or so. Um, and I actually think that's the right policy um, because of what we're in. Um, but I do worry that at some point um, that foreign investors will worry about um, what the dollar is going to do and therefore stop holding the treasuries. And when we look at our current account deficit right now, private capital inflows over the last year have stopped, period. It's completely being financed by official governments. And that means a nice way of saying the People's Bank of China and the Bank of Japan and the Middle East. Um, and that may actually be a interim steady state because they want, they want their currencies to appreciate now. Um, but you would ideally like to have a little more diversity. And it does set up the case where you could have a policy mistake, especially um, if you pick the wrong fight with one of these people. Um, you know, that you started a trade policy or something. Um, I don't think it's likely, but it's just you like have a little more diversity in, in the people that you're dead. Um, so I worry more about the devaluing. Uh, okay, we only have time for one more question. Is this other Wolf Brookman uh, with the American Chamber of Commerce in Germany. Um, my source of deepest concern about getting out of the global financial crisis is the long-term term behavior of savings, uh, and particularly in the four countries we just talked about, uh, the, the, the uh, debtor countries, uh, US, UK, Spain, Australia. Uh, I wonder if our panel could just comment on whether they feel the savings rate behavior in those countries in particular will change enough to ultimately correct the liquidity of the dollars globally. Um, it, it is changing here. If you look at the, the savings rate um, at the start of the year was basically zero, which it's been for a while. And in the last two months, it's jumped up to 1.3 percentage points. And you know, I think if we have a you know a 91 uh, 2001 style recession, it'll probably go to four percentage points. And if we have something worse than an 82 or 75 recession, which is very possible when you're deleveraging. It's going to go to something like eight percent points, um, and so we are. I think this is a consumer-led um, recession in the savings rate. Actually, we've seen it the last two months, and I would expect it to continue, continue rising for another year. You have an enormous reverse wealth effect. So you just think about the baby boom generation, for example, and what's happened to its retirement savings in the last few months. Um, people will work longer, but also at least aspire to save more. The other thing I would bring to this too is um, against that is the, the very rapid aging of China, 
in Japan, and really all the rest of the developed world except the United States. It's really coming on fast now. China's labor force will start contracting next year. Um, and then it's on a course to age as much in the next generation as France did in the last 150 years. And so demographically, we're seeing a sea change. And we don't know exactly how financial systems relate to demography of that kind. We've never seen those kind of rapid movements in, in population pyramids. <laughs> but it kind of stands to reason that a, a, a China that is rapidly aging is not going is going to have to repatriate a lot of its foreign investment. They're going to need it. Japan too already, which is shrinking in absolute size now. Um, so that's that creates a a new world of um, finance in which we cannot any longer necessarily rely on the excess savings of these countries that have been until recently in a kind of demographic sweet spot. Um, with a very large middle-aged productive population. Well, thank you. It's been a very uh, thought-provoking uh, conversation, and I think there are a few more people with questions that you might want to come up and see if people, if uh, people will be able to answer it afterwards. Thank you very much for coming.